I thank you for the introduction and congratulations on the two-year birthday. <laughs> I'll start with a little bit of ancient history and then uh, pick up. We've only got about 15 minutes for this and this could very easily be a half-day seminar that might be more suited to someone trying to develop tools to create maps, which limits the audience to Lidos and about a dozen other companies. Uh, but what I'm, my goal today is to teach you what's in a map and why it's there. It may seem a little complicated, but we've made it as simple as we possibly can. And it li links to the SPAT, and uh, you just literally cannot have one without the other. I'll go over some of the basics of how the encoding works. Because of the presence of tools, most of you never have to dig into the depth of ASM1 details. But just about anything you're going to come across, and in fact, I'd say nine, 990 out of 1,000 maps is, is capable of being represented. And therefore, there's some complexity that might not be there or, or evident why we chose it that way. But we'll go through a couple of the, uh, the most typical use cases that come up. We'll explain a, a concept called connects to, which is how the lanes in the map intersection are connected to the signal phase movements in the signal controller by way of the SPAT. Then pedestrian crossings are very popular. We'll spend a little bit of time on that, recap putting it all together, and give a little pragmatic advice because today uh, no tool does entirely what is wanted, and all tools are growing in terms of their uh, ability. And there's ways to test a good map. There's some ways not to test a good map. Finally, I've got two pages of resources because to understand the map process, you've got to have civil engineering skills, uh, message set skills, and a fair amount of GIS skills. And that's a pretty uh, tough combination. So starting right away, maps and spats, one doesn't exist without the other. Spats do represent the, uh, the movements and the phases and the time on the wall when those moves will end. Uh, Patrick misspoke a little bit about phase one spat. It's always been a series of what are called time marks rather than tight countdown timers. What happened between the 2009 copy and the current copy is we could only estimate a phase a minute ahead. And various people with fixed timing said they wanted more, so now you can estimate a phase 30 minutes ahead. But otherwise, the, the basic principle of modulo time is the same. Uh, when they're used together, all maps and spats fit in a PSID called intersection safety. The map is also used for things beyond intersections, although that's a relatively immature area in the DSRC message set. The plan is all roadways, temporary roadworks, incident management, close a lane and trim some trees. It will all be represented with map primitives. Right now, the message set's only got 15 messages in it, and, and map is used for mostly intersections, but like I said, has, has great growth potential. Things we won't cover today are requesting a preemption and priority and how you understand the, the general status of a signal once you've asked for that priority. Um, right now, we are working on a recommended practices document. It will be called 49-10. That will deal with a pragmatic advice for maps and spats and clean up a few minor things we found. A similar document called Slash 11, chaired by Larry Head, will be dealing with preemption and priority issues. And I'd like to show you a typical uh, map. Oops, I think I've lost a slide. I lost a slide. No, it's, it's a forward in a moment. My mistake. Sorry to get out of sync. Let's start with the basics. What's in a map? Well, a map is not an intersection. It's as many as 32 intersections, although everything done today has been one intersection. Within each of those 32 intersections are a collection of lanes. Everything done in the map is in a simple orthogonal XYZ system. It translates from the elliptical system of the Earth of, of latitudes and longitudes to a flat orthogonal system. Maps support a one centimeter resolution, which just happens to be about one tenth of one micro degree. It's 101 centimeters in one direction and about 80 to 89 in the others. How you convert to that is a technical issue that a tool like Lidos would do for you. Resources in the back have further links. Maps are transmitted as compressed messages. DSRC does not have a lot of bandwidth. So rather than giving lat long points of every little point, what you're given is the offset in terms of centimeters from the last point. 
it's an important thing to understand. You've got to flatten a map before you use it. They're not, unlike BSMs, usable right out of the box. And it's pretty easy to put a BSM on a map. You just subtract the anchor point of the map and translate the resulting deltas in, into centimeters by multiplying twice, and you're there. Now, for spats, it's a little bit different. Spats represent one or more intersections. It can be as many as four, and again, there's only been one. Each intersection can have a number of active movements. All reds are not transmitted. You can transmit them, but that's not a best practice. Of the 32 possible active movements, each movement has a pile of times. Those times are how you tell when the light will change and what it will change to. This supports not only uh, classic signal stuff, but eco-driving, where you can tell a vehicle, uh, expect a green in 37 seconds, and he can manage his power. And there's some dithering in there if you don't want people uh, jumping the light on you. Another concept about SPAT is it holds more than just the intersection. It holds uh, which lanes are currently active and which regulatory rules are in place. If you've got, uh, for example, speed zones that vary with uh, the school day or lanes that are parking at one time of the day and not another time of the day, that time information is in SPAT. SPAT is a dynamic message. Maps are essentially static messages. Now I'd like to show you a map. I've shown you a map with polygons drawn from the 2009 version of the standard that was deployed in Anthem before the MITSC work. You're seeing some BSM vehicles plotted on top of it. I believe that's Larry Head driving, to be honest. This was where an early test uh, facility was put up and has been kept up. Most people don't have a, a tool like this, but it's pretty simple to take maps, render them into polygons, put a BSM on it, and then uh, gain some useful feedback. But you can also look at this map, and we could look at this in detail, but we haven't the time, and you'll see gaps. You'll see areas where the edges of the stop lines don't align. You'll see a number of attributes, if you're familiar with that area, like curbs and medians and crosswalks with, uh, with uh, places that would be ADA handicapped problematic that are not on the map. And that, that was some of the stuff that was addressed in the 2016, that is the current. And I'm going to go into details of what's in a map and how it's constructed. Basically, a map is nothing but a pile of lanes. All the lanes are generically similar, as opposed to the 2009 copy, where there's a lot of hierarchy, and, and it made it difficult to write the software. There are eight basic types of lanes. From the point of view of the map, a pedestrian lane and a motor vehicle lane just have different flags set in their header. There are also things like uh, bicycle lanes, uh, trains for tracked vehicles, and medians. Medians can be important to describe if you're trying to support public safety that might cross over them. Medians can be important if you're going to route your buses along the median for high density use, which is a project just starting up in San Diego. Each lane type then has the attributes you need to describe it. For example, uh, audio-visual cl clues for ADA crossing of a, uh, of a pedestrian crosswalk make no sense for a motor vehicle lane, and vice versa. And then within each lane, there are a series of nodes. Nodes are how the lane are described. And at each node and between each node can be attributes. I'll come back to that. The attribute system is relatively complex and allows you to add new things. We knew when we were building this that new attributes were going to come out of the woodwork. So it's possible to add regional attributes. Oh, that's another minor point. Patrick said a region meant a country. It's purposefully ill-defined in SAE. And the, the, the use case is a country could be the North Americas or Santa Monica. Those were always the two examples given. But anybody can add regional content in a particular way and still um, meet the conformance requirements of the SAE standard. This was designed to provide a means for people to experiment but still be valid, still be interoperable, and also provide a means for the committee to say, well, look, it's been deployed. People liked it. Now, we've, now let's move it from regional into the full standard. A couple of more things about the generic lane. Every lane has default values. Think of it like a style sheet. Within the intersection, there is a section that says, what's the default lane width? If you're using common design properties, that's the only time you have to describe the width of the lane. 
or if it differs. Uh, one of the things we talked about this morning in the MAPSPAT uh, task force meetings was we probably will expand that to have a default lane for sidewalks. They hardly ever follow the same design geometry as the road. Inside the lane, we've got a series of nodes. Nodes, again, are just offsets. I'll show that on the next slide. At the top of each lane are a number of attributes. Amongst the attributes are the maneuvers that you can make at the stop sign or stop line. Here I've shown a variety of graphical maneuvers, but the uh, 186 countries that drive on what we call the wrong side of the road have parallel versions. For example, you can make a U-turn on the right. It's in the standard. You wouldn't deploy that in North America. Um, Okay, going a little bit further for how the polygons of lanes are described, rather than describe four corners and points, we describe center lines and widths. So a simple two-node point intersection, which is what many of you may start with for your first intersections, is simply the center of the stop line and about 300 meters back and whatever your width is. However, you can modify that with a lot of different uh, attributes. One of the most common is a sense of skew. Stop lines are, are rarely ever a perfect 90 degrees, and when lanes stack up to each other, you, you need that skew to know if you've got a line violation. And finally, in this, on this slide, from one point to another is a filleting process. The points simply project, and you get a nice, clean polygon. A little bit of math, but nothing. everybody on this phone call survived high school, so you're all familiar and can relearn it if you had to. A little bit more about generic lane attributes. Attributes are things that live either at a specific node or between a specific node. The attribute system in the Lidos tool and every other tool I've ever seen is still very, very weak. It's because it really didn't exist in 2009 when that tool was architected or in our tools either. Um, but attributes basically allow you to state something from a period of, from one point to another. The classic example is a do not block. A do not block might also have a stop line at the, at the other end of the do not block, another attribute. Um, a good example for an attribute that's localized to a, a node rather than spanning one would be a curb at a crosswalk. Uh, if the curb is not canted but, but it has a step off, that's an ADA concern to some people. You may care to encode that. Finally, we need to talk about the all-important connects to. Every lane has a stop line. Well, most lanes have a stop line. And every lane with a stop line has a connects to, where a variety of connections, notice that it says you have 16, tells you what it connects to and which signal group it is. And the signal group is how you connect it back to the movement phase. There's some other useful information here. And you notice that maneuver is, 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 is uh, dotted here. That in indicates it's optional. It's not necessarily uh, appropriate to tell everybody where every lane goes, but, but it allows that provision. Now I'm going to talk about multiple lane use. Harkening back to what I said before, maps are static. Sta uh, maps are static. Spats are dynamic. So if you look at this. Uh, right on red sign here, and you notice it's placarded for certain days and times, it's the responsibility of the SPAT to tell you when that is active, because the SPAT knows what time it is. The way this is implemented in the map message is there are two essentially identical lanes, and the allowed maneuvers at the stop line from one of them permit the right on red and prohibit the right on red in the other lane. We use this trick for reversible lanes, time of day parking, right on reds, any other crossing regulations that will vary with time. And the key thing to know here is that SPAPs are more than just signal controller states as a result of that. OK, so I'm going to go through a connects to example. And this would, do, this would do better with animation, but I wasn't sure how far we could push it. So allow me, I, I, when I move my mouse, do people see those? I guess they do not. Um, no, I don't think so, David. Okay. On, on the lower left is a uh, lane with a forward arrow to the right and a, and a black line indicating the stop line. Let's presume that this is a left turn and through lane, and it has these attributes. No U-turns allowed, a left is allowed, and a movement ahead is allowed. No U-turn with the X there. If, if the map doesn't say you can do it, you can't do it. 
That's why I drew it a little bit differently. So in this example, no U-turn would be allowed. And you'd want to look at the signal heads and the signal light, and therefore in, in, in MAPSPAT ease, the signal group ID, to tell when you were allowed to go to the left turn lane. Now if we look at this classic doghouse here, you'll notice those words are a little different. Those are the words that the international traffic engineers, some American representatives, some uh, Australian, British, and many European representatives came up with as the most, uh, for lack of a politically correct phrase, gender neutral way we could explain what we meant. You'll have to look into the standard. In fact, we very specifically tried to avoid using colors. Some countries have things like flash on green before you can go, and those are in there as well, although we don't use them in, the, in America. So when you get the protected uh, movement to the left, it's going to come from one group ID, and you might make that left-hand turn. When you get that green admissive ball, you can move ahead, but of course it's not uh, protected. And that's going to come from a different group ID. If you were the vehicle sitting at that stop line, you would know what lane you're in, and therefore what connects to match to you, and therefore which of these groups matches to you. And uh, my footnote here is, is worthy of mention, too. Uh, New York's done both this and, and a different pattern. Not all maps have to be self-contained. It's a, a pattern of the map design that you might describe the ingress lanes in one message and the egress lanes in another intersection, in another map. So just a real quick pedestrian crossing example. Typically, pedestrian crossings are just two-point nodes that are put about a meter or more in to the uh, sidewalk. Scrambles are supported. You can you can you can do the lines if you want to. I'm I'm told that some scrambles after football games in Michigan don't even pay attention to the lines. It's just a mass movement. You can you can do that as well. Crosswalks are a little bit odd in that they've got some ADA issues. For example, a median jutting into the walkway can be very problematic if you're in a wheelchair and force you to go uh, outside of the safe zone. So that, things like that are in there as well. It's very common to have tapers. I'm not aware of, of the perfect intersection that goes left and right and up and down, but tapers most often come up with crosswalks. Here is a crosswalk in the New York deployment. You can see the taper on the top. This is dealt with with changing, changing the width and changing the end taper. And comp complex geometry like that requires some skill in the GIS tool but otherwise, uh, it's in the map. And with time, these tools will all grow to be able to support it better. So coming down to a summing up point, your typical map has one intersection with many lanes. In each lane is a group ID. Typical SPAT has one intersection, transmits the active movements, each one of which has time marks. And the time marks, are, again, are a wall clock when the things will change. And those are connected to the group ID. The group ID is the link between the two of them. These guys live in a PSID called Safety App. Signal request and intersection collision aren't covered. There's also a message called uh, intersection safety or intersection collision message. That's basically a BSM repeat to tell other people that something bad is, is about to happen. And if you need help plotting uh, BSMs on the map, if this doesn't make sense, drop me a line and I'll show you how to do it a, a little uh, in a little more technical detail. Now, I'm going to very quickly conclude these sections because we've got another speaker to talk about it. But the normal way to build a map is to gather source maps, translate those source maps to WGS 84, not state plane coordinates, not NAD 27, not, God forbid, Google coordinates. Then you capture that into some kind of GIS tool, typically in JSON or KML. You avoid ASN1 as long as you can. You add these lane attributes, and then you reduce it to ASN1. And then you can QC the work to make sure the lanes don't uh, overlap each other or leave huge gaps. And I see I left a, a comment to myself there that needed to be removed. So a good map has the following features. It's, it's essentially self-contained accuracy should be a decimeter. It's, its connection to some sort of truth, that is WGS 84, ought to be better than a half a meter. And you really need to have very few gaps between the lanes. What usually happens with the BSM algorithm to put it in a lane is you take the center point of the BSM and you embiggen it. Yes, that's the Simpsons reference to the reference to the size of the vehicle, 
and then try to place it with a center of gravity mentality into the correct lane. It's also important to have some traceability. You're, you're not going to do this map once. You're going to keep updating it as conditions change. So you need to know how you created it, what, what the source map was, what the frame of reference was, how the coordinations took place. Chances are that unless you're using GPS, you're not getting WGS84. So there's some translation from a state repertoire of maps. Then a couple more slides here. There is an official PSID for, that you should use for this. There's also a range of test IDs that uh, SAE has arranged with IEEE that you can use. There is a range of intersection numbers that we didn't have time to go into, but there's a chunk for an experimental range. Those make a good place to start. Numbering pla practices are all being developed by SAE now, and they'll end up in the slash 10. They'll be a rep they will be recommended practices, not normative. Um, it's common that you need corrections at the intersection, because that's the moment you're trying to figure out when a vehicle is at the stop line or when it's going to exceed past the stop line. And you've got some design choices, one of which is just who's signing the messages. That continues to be up in the air with different uh, architectures being proposed. Finally, if you find there's something you need, it can be added in the local content, in the regional content, and just call. We'll show you how to do it. Because if you felt you needed it, maybe somebody else does. So on behalf of the SAE committee, we want to know about it to try to include it. And I've got a couple of resources here. I won't show those on the screen for long. You can uh, acquire the standard from SAE. I put it in an XML image if you want it. These three have to deal with uh, datums and lat long issues. And basically, these are some of the tools that were used in the graphics. All but one of these is openly available and free. Uh, and the final thing is some commentary we're putting together that is still very draft, but it's, it's supposed to answer the how do I do this kind of questions. I think at this point, I turn this over to Chuck.